Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Chris Tuttle. I will be your presenter today. We are looking forward to talking about Google Analytics and measuring our online reach and how we can utilize that data and information to get more visitors to our website. Um, I am an Idealware expert trainer. I uh, have been working actually for Idealware for about three years now, delivering trainings both in person and online. Um, I've worked in the nonprofit space for my entire 20 year career, uh, working within and now consulting for nonprofits on a variety of digital engagement strategies. I started out as a community organizer and uh, tech geek and uh, have since gone on to work for some software companies doing internet solutions for different nonprofit organizations before moving on to my own consulting firm a few years ago. Uh, so I still today work with state, regional, and global nonprofits, foundations, and other organizations. Uh, so still in the field doing this work while also talking and training about it. So today we're going to talk about web analytics. Looks like y'all are already getting a preview. I'm, I'm somewhat assuming uh, everyone here is using web analytics. So we'll talk about how do we get started with Google Analytics, uh, what exactly analytics can collect. Uh, we're going to focus on Google Analytics as our web analytics platform today, but the uh, topics and the strategies we're talking about with Google Analytics applies basically well, mostly to all web analytics software uh, should you be using a different system. Uh, but Google Analytics has kind of become the go-to system for web analytics. So we'll talk about that data, the body of data that exists in Google Analytics, and what we can learn from that information, how we can analyze that data so we're not just looking at numbers, but we're actually looking at patterns and we're looking at historical references to figure out what those numbers mean, and how we can easily maintain metrics so that we're not only looking at them every once in a while or when we need to know something, but that we're actually uh, continually looking and utilizing those metrics to improve our work. So what are web analytics? You know, simply put, web analytics are, are simply metrics associated with our web properties that allow us to better understand who's using our website, how they're using it, and what they're using it for, what they're getting out of it. Uh, web analytics are not perfect in that there's a, a variety of technical issues that can complicate the collection of web analytics, uh, including IP addresses assigned in offices that may create uh, duplicate matches or duplicate metrics. Um, and there's other issues, of course, nowadays with privacy and blocking software that limit the ability for us to collect every single visitor's uh, data. However, I, kind of, I generally find that metrics and web analytics or software, that those problems that exist uh, can typically exist day to day. They're not starting one day or, or, or uh, significant in one month and not the next. So I find that the data typically levels out. There may be some general errors within the data. It may not be exactly precise. However, we can measure a lift in traffic, or we can see new sources. We can see when pages start having increased bounce rates. Uh, in other words, they may be failing. Uh, so even though some of those errors exist, the, the data, when used as a whole, can still be incredibly helpful in helping us figure out who our constituents are and how they're using our web properties. So Web Analytics is the measurement of uh, measurement collection and analysis of those web metrics. Uh, we think it's to find answers to the questions we have, usually about how we can improve our work, how we can make our websites perform better for those who are engaging our constituents, and how we can actually uh, take action towards meeting our goals better. And while there's a lot of benchmarks out there around the industry, and we have a lot of organizations that are creating regular benchmark reports each year, um, they're all nice to know, and they're definitely helpful, but none of them are us. They're averages of a variety of organizations or sectors of our industry, often combining organizations that look very unalike. The best way we can compare our metrics is by comparing against our own data. And so comparing year-to-year, -year, monthly averages, and campaign-to-campaign -campaign over time, that's going to help us best improve. So first and foremost, 
you already got a screenshot. It looks like y'all were looking in and starting to play around in Google Analytics. It sounds like uh, hopefully everyone here has already been in Google Analytics before. Uh, but the first and foremost is just to remember this view by date. It's very easy to get lost in the data of Google Analytics and forget the date settings that, you, that are uh, being applied across your metrics. Um, so the view date settings are always in the upper right-hand corner of any screen or any report you're looking at within Google Analytics. And they can be easily changed to include just about any amount of time and also to compare any amount of time across another amount of time. With comparing time frames, we believe it's actually helpful or most helpful to compare the annual time frames. So this past month versus this month last year versus the same month the year before. When we're compare, it, 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 frequent habit of a lot of folks to compare month to month. Um, but that's not always going to be an accurate picture of our website and how it's being used. Comparing December to November is probably going to be completely skewed because of our end of the year fundraising appeals and other campaigns or annual reports that we may be putting out at the end of the year in December that are driving a lot of traffic where November may be a month where we don't have as many communications pointing people to our website. So by comparing year to year, we can better see the type of metrics as, uh, as they relate to a similar time of year before. Um, likewise, I would also encourage us to remember that campaigns, so campaigns are timely events that uh, often have specific goals or sub-goals from our larger ongoing communications work. Um, campaigns can often also throw off our metrics. If we're partaking in Giving Tuesday, uh, or another giving day, then that's probably going to have an increase in web views and searches uh, than other days of, of the year. And so those campaigns may also need to be compared against other similar campaigns or past participation in those campaigns to get the best metrics. And when we're looking at all of these analytics, when we're looking through all the metrics, what we're typically looking for is spikes. We're looking for changes in behavior. We're looking for when something different happened. Uh, sometimes that may be a slow increase over time, and sometimes that may be a sudden lift or a sudden spike like we see here, in which we might want to investigate and figure out what exactly happened that caused the increase in visits on this specific date. The spikes are often going to be telling of uh, key incidents of when something has occurred. So let's get started with Google Analytics. So why Google Analytics? Uh, it's become, as I was saying, the industry standard, especially for nonprofit organizations, for measuring our web traffic. Uh, it is a, in, a truly robust tool that is free and basically fairly easy to set up to start tracking the metrics that you, you want to know about your website. Um, the one problem with it is that it, of course, does track so much data and so many metrics that it can be a bit overwhelming to make sense of it all and to understand what it means. Uh, Google Analytics also provides these stats and uh, can help us if we understand how to set it up. It can help us create dashboards, reports, or even goals and funnels that will allow us to easily focus on the metrics that are most important to us and most relate to our goals. To note, there is a paid version of Google Analytics now called Google Analytics Premium. Uh, along with the whole Google Analytics 360 suite of tools that they are rolling out. Uh, premium is, uh, I think, really only necessary for very, very large organizations with very complex web ecosystems. So organizations with more than 50 websites they're tracking data for, chapter sites, microsites, or otherwise, uh, and really in-depth, robust campaigns in which they need the one-on-one -on -one support from Google that Premium comes with. And it does come at a cost. So setting up our Google Analytics. Uh, hopefully you've already done this, but uh, Google Analytics provides you a simple tracking code uh, via your Google Analytics tracking ID, your Google Analytics code, or now utilizing Google Tag Manager. Um, whichever method you use, there are step-by-step -step directions within Google Analytics that will walk you through how to do it, how to verify you on a site, and how to properly set up your code and verify your code is working. 
Uh, do note that some features we'll, we'll even talk about today do require that you're using the latest version of the code in order to properly utilize, like demographics or events. Some configuration tips for uh, while we're setting up these analytics accounts and profiles. If you may notice when you're using other websites, third-party websites, uh, Tumblr even, that, uh, or you're creating a new microsite, maybe for, for a specific campaign that you're launching, that there's, you can add multiple uh, websites to your Google Analytics account, and they can each have separate ID numbers so that they're tracked separately. Or you can use the same Google Analytics ID across multiple websites. Um, I would encourage you to think about doing the, the former, of using one Google ID or Analytics ID, and that tracking ID is that UA number that you see right here in the middle, is that I would use one ID per website you're tracking. Microsites are the only ones that we may sometimes uh, do differently, but we can combine these metrics from multiple sites and look at them uh, a whole, across different domains. Uh, so there's no need to use one ID for multiple sites. And if we use them individually, it'll allow us to better filter and see data to specific properties. Um, so this, what this looks like in practice is our uh, container folder is going to be our account folder. Uh, so you'll probably have one container folder. That's that very first one here that says Idealware. And you'll probably have one container folder for your organization. And then underneath that, you would have your different account IDs per web domain or web property that you're setting up. Uh, beneath that, you can create filters in which you can filter the data in order to look at the data in different ways. So if you want to continually filter out staff traffic via your IP addresses used internally at your office, or if you want to filter out uh, certain spam referrals, there are ways we can do that with filters. So your account, your site, and your filter. The one other note is that first filter, that first view you set up, is don't ever apply a filter to that very first view you set up. Allow that first view of data when you first set up your account to be a non-filtered uh, raw data file. And the reason being is you can always duplicate that and create an additional filter. So you can create an additional view of your data in which you apply those filters we just talked about, removing certain web traffic or certain referrals. Uh, but the problem is once you apply a filter, it stops tracking that data. Whatever data you filtered out, isn't just hidden from your report, it actually stops being tracked. So you want to make sure that you have one raw data view of which no filters are applied so that you can always go back to the original in case there are any other issues in the future. So what does Google Analytics collect? Well, we have the uh, sidebars along this uh, left-hand side of your screen when you sign in that will help you filter through the different types of data that's available to us. And we're going to walk through each of these uh, individually and talk about what they provide for you. So first and foremost is audience. And within the audience section, we're going to see a lot of information specifically about that, our audience. Um, that's going to include uh, who they are, but also uh, how they're using our site. And we're also going to have some information that is, uh, has to be configured, um, but your demographic information. But first and foremost, your audience is going to include your sessions, your users, your page views, your bounce rate, your percentage of new sessions. Um, I feel like these are kind of the five basic metrics we get across most Google Analytics dashboards. Uh, and they should, for the most part, be self-explanatory. Sessions is the number of times your sites have been visited. Users is the number of uh, viewers and unique viewers to your site. Page views are the total number of pages. So one viewer may reload the same page 10 times or may visit 10 pages. So there will be multiple views. And then your bounce rate and percent of new sessions, uh, two quality stats that can help out a lot of organizations make some decisions on where to focus on our website. Our bounce rates are the percentage of people who immediately leave after visiting one page. And we have to remember that not everybody visits our website via the home page. They may have received a link 
in our email or received a link via Twitter or seen a shared article via Facebook. So bounce rates are on or in every page of our site, uh, as well as our site overall has an average bounce rate. Um, so that bounce rate is going to really help us figure out how interesting our content often is and that we can tell whether or not the actions in the content have resulted or the, or the calls to action in our content have resulted in follow-up actions. So if we have a, let's uh, just to put this in perspective here, if we have an advocacy petition on our website and we're linking to it and telling everybody to come to it, and we see though that in Google Analytics that that web page hosting the advocacy petition has a high bounce rate, then we probably know that the advocacy petition is not effective in getting people to sign it because signing it would have been an action and would have taken them to a confirmation page. So therefore, they wouldn't have bounced. They would have gone to a secondary page. There are sometimes, though, when bounce rates are actually good. For instance, if somebody's looking up our phone number or address and they're Googling that and they're taken to our contact page, they see our phone number or our address, the next logical step for them is to close out the browser because they're calling us or writing us a check. And so they're done with that. And so in that case, the bounce rate may not be such a bad thing. Percentages of new sessions are, are just that. It's a percent of, of the, the sessions of which are that, that Google thinks are from first-time visitors. Uh, just remember that this is not 100% accurate because uh, it is utilizing cookies that are stored in browser settings in order to track whether or not the visitor has been to the site before. And as most of us know and probably experience ourselves, uh, all of our browsers are different and set differently for how long we track cookies. Uh, some people track them indefinitely. Some, they're cleared out every browser session. So that big problem with the bounce rate, was just as I was describing, is it's really helpful for understanding when we have content that has clear calls to action. It's helpful for us understanding whether or not those pages, often landing pages we're calling them because of the, page, the, the first page somebody lands on on our website. It's helpful in knowing whether or not those actions are working because if they didn't take the actions they will be, and they just left the site, they'll be considered a bounce. Uh, but as mentioned, it can be problematic in telling uh, exactly what it means in that it may mean they got the information they needed, like on a bio or a contact page, and so they had no other need to stay around the site. So just knowing that it can mean two different things, sometimes the same stat can mean two different things depending on the content we're applying it to. Uh, Chris, Within, can I just yes. – this is Terry. Let me just interject um, something about sort of the bounce rate, and I just want to support what you're saying, right? So, so uh, you know, if you look at your landing pages, for example, in, in Google Analytics, if you drill into the landing page report, and, for example, I'm looking at ours on the um, IllinoisLegalAid.org site, and our, the, first, the first landing page is our homepage, and it has a bounce rate of 27%, which is good. Right. Yeah, the good. next page is a content page, and the content is what's the difference between dismissed with and without prejudice. The bounce rate on that page is 96 <laughs> percent. So, uh, you know, so, so obviously <laughs> the way I read that is people are getting the answer they need right <laughs> from that yep. page and from the home page they're going they're drilling in right to um, to additional content. So. Yeah, and, and actually, let's go ahead and talk. So one of the things we can do in those cases, like that's a great example. You have a great, you have a great resource or article. It sounds like it's providing the content they need. You didn't necessarily expect another action or a follow-up step. Um, but something else that we can do is use events, and we're going to come back and talk about events later, is that on those pages like an article where we want to know, well, did people actually read the article or not? Um, events can help us in tracking scrolls. And so we can, for instance, I often will track a 75% scroll, meaning that I'm tracking what percentage of users scrolled 75% down on the page as an idea of who read the article. And so we may need to start looking at secondary stats. But so. Other information under audiences, uh, audience reports that we can find, including that demographic information uh, that they've somewhat recently, a couple years ago now, added. Uh, we can find out who's using our site based on what type of device. 
So desktop versus mobile versus tablet. You're undergoing a new website redesign. You're trying to help your executive staff understand the need to budget a responsive, a, a mobile-friendly website. We can show them clear stats on who's using our website via what device. And you can even see from here often uh, the percentages of, of sessions, but also the bounce rate. And so what we'll typically find is that the bounce rate will be very high for mobile visits on websites that are not mobile friendly or mobile optimized. And that makes sense, right? If a user's coming to our website via a mobile device and they're getting a web page that's hard to read, they're not going to stick around. So we can utilize that mobile data to help back up some decisions we need to make on managing our systems and ensuring that they're mobile friendly. We can use it to understand what technology folks are using. Uh, if we want to know what, what browser or what operating system folks are using when visiting our site. We can see geo information to figure out what city, state, or even countries people are visiting us from. We can see behavior and engagement information, so including how long users stay on our, web, on web, our website as a whole or even specific pages. And then we can now see interest and demographics. Now, note the interest and demographic data does have to be enabled. So it is not collected by default. It has to be turned on, and you do have to be using the latest Google Analytics code. So if you aren't sure or you haven't seen this before, it's really simple. All you have to do is just go to Google Analytics, go under the Audiences section, then Demographics, and you will see instructions there and a button that says Enable. And it will tell you whether or not you're using the correct code. And if you need to update it, it will provide the code to update it. Um, this, the demographic data, as you can imagine, is pretty, pretty great. It's not 100% it's not reliable as, as, uh, in that a lot of people, of course, have not provided demographic information, or uh, there may be times in which demographic information is actually hidden because there's not enough information uh, that they can't aggregate it without giving away confidential information. So for instance, if you get one visit from a specific city, Google won't share that information with you uh, because it uh, gives away potentially the privacy of somebody. Uh, you might be able to figure out who it is based on what city they, they came from, what device they're using, what web page they looked at. Uh, so it only utilizes the demographic information when it has enough of a data set to anonymize it and ensure that no privacy is, is uh, being compromised. Uh, likewise, the interest information gives you some very general, high-level interest buckets that your users uh, are known, or your visitors, your website visitors, are known to be interested in uh, based on other things they've done. Um, this can be helpful. It, it, it's very general, so it depends on your organization and how you could or might use this information. Uh, but we have used this interest information, for instance, with an advocacy organization, uh, we saw that uh, there was a, a actually a similar here. There was a high level of uh, movie lovers, and so we were able to actually start talking about the organization's issue in the context of movies, in which the topic had been presented or brought up. And uh, we found that it was actually a really interesting way for us to talk about the organization's issue, which was actually violence, uh, because it actually it. it would met better basically to our constituents in that the content was something that we knew a majority of our audience already enjoyed was movies. So it can sometimes be interesting and might give us some ideas of other content we might uh, decide to focus on or create. The other thing to remember is that throughout this audience section, throughout all the reports within the audience section and elsewhere within Google Analytics, uh, we can drive down uh, deeper into our, our metrics by utilizing the secondary dimension. And so sometimes this is not very helpful. As I, I often find that the, uh, the primary metrics I, I most need are usually already pulled out in these columns that we see uh, on most reports by Google automatically. They know what a lot of their primary metrics are. But there are times where we may want to compare against the secondary metric. Uh, so we may want to see who's visiting our website, uh, plus how deep they go. So who's visiting our website by device, mobile or desktop, 
compared to how deep they go, how many pages they visit. And so those would be the types of things we can utilize with secondary metrics. So you'll see when you click that secondary metric drop down on any report, uh, you'll see the full list of different dimensions that can be brought in. You can also type in the search field uh, anything that you either a label that you already know of a specific metric or uh, a word that you think applies. And Google does a fairly good job of trying to help guide us into the right list there. So actually, this is a good one that we did of combining both locations and age groups. Uh, so both locations, geographic location of our users, our visitors to our website, and age group demographics are both readily available to us as separate reports, but there isn't a combined report. And so we wanted to see here uh, whether or not we had different site traffic and visitors uh, not just by location, but also what were the age group breakdowns of the different countries people were visiting us from. Acquisition. So the acquisition section is going to tell us just that. It's information that helps us understand how we came to acquire the web visitors. And that's going to include uh, all their sessions and possible conversions if we have set up conversions and goals. And we'll talk about those in a bit. Uh, but it's also going to include uh, information around organic search, people who found us naturally. Uh, organic in search means we didn't pay for it. It means it was a natural listing in a search engine result that the user clicked and found us. Direct are those visitors who clicked the link, who saved the link, or who already knew the link or typed it into the browser. So if they didn't have another website or, or medium forwarding them to us, but they otherwise somehow clicked the link, typed it in, uh, clicked it via email, excuse me, typed it in, or chose a bookmark that was previously saved. Referral is traffic from another website. So any third-party website, any website you don't own is considered a referral. Uh, Google is doing better at dividing social network traffic into a social section, but we should note that sometimes social traffic will be combined under referral as well. And, so, and it will sometimes also be separated out. We see this commonly with mobile links that are clicked from Facebook and Twitter using Twitter's t.co link shortener or Facebook's m.facebook.com URL uh, format for their mobile visit. Um, so it will be up to you to, to figure out how you're going to look at that. You can filter those views directly out of your reports when you're looking at referral reports. Uh, and that way you can separate them out and see the social traffic versus the uh, referral, the, the true third-party referral traffic. So looking at some of the ways that we can utilize the reports that come within acquisitions, we can utilize the channels to understand how folks are finding us, whether organic or paid search, direct, referral, social. Um, you may have actually noticed we are starting to see more and more email uh, separated out automatically by Google. Um, Google's really good at understanding referrals via e or acquisitions via email when the email was a Google account, a Gmail account. Um, it's not really great at understanding it yet uh, when it's other email providers. And so the email, of course, is not going to be entirely uh, accurate. And so I, I, I personally have not really used email that much yet uh, as I'm still waiting on it to improve a bit more. We also have our social acquisition, and so we can tell what social networks folks uh, are finding us from. Remember that all of these referrals, all of these acquisitions, are not necessarily our own shared content. So this doesn't necessarily mean these are people who came and visited via our Facebook page. It's people who came via any Facebook page. So that includes both the post you're sharing, the content you're sharing, and linking back to your website, as well as all the content anybody else may be sharing across social networks. So the social report obviously is a great place to find out which social network works best for driving traffic to your site. When combined with secondary metric dimensions, you can determine things like not only which social network drives the most traffic to your site, but which users from which social network spend the most time on your website, or convert via a goal. In other words, sign a petition, make a donation, or sign up for your email list. We can also utilize campaign reports. And campaign reports do require source-coded URLs. But if you're using Google's URL builder, 
which is a really easy tool to add uh, secondary source information to your URLs, then that sourced URL inf information, like the campaigns, will be tracked directly here within our campaigns. And so each of these were source coded URLs that we see in the campaigns example, and we named what the code was, which allows us to easily track how that URL with the code was utilized across multiple channels, across different social networks, across the emails we're sending out, across sharing from our website even. So when creating campaigns, you can use those tracking codes and you can group them into actions. Um, so this is actually a screenshot that we utilized with a campaign that we were running uh, last year in which we were doing different types of outreach for a new event. And we had a campaign website, and we wanted to track all the different ways uh, folks were coming to our website uh, beyond the built-in methods of social network or referral third-party website. So we knew we had ads that we were going to be placing across multiple digital channels and blogs. We had Google partners, uh, which were secondary ads, so basically just a part of the Google ad network. We had our organizational outreach partners. We also had uh, pre-launch communications that were coming from our own organization. Uh, so we separated out each of these into individual campaigns, and we even utilized uh, more detailed source coding to identify the specific places we were placing the ads and the specific partners who were promoting our campaign. And so we could dive down and into this data, and we could clearly see what type of outreach we did that was the most effective across communications channels, both online and off. And we were also able to tell which partners performed best in outreaching for the event, as well as which ads performed best. So this is that URL builder, uh, form builder I was talking about, in which we have uh, opportunities to create five keyword or five source code keywords. Uh, three are required, and that is your source, your medium, and your campaign. And it's pretty clear in the instructions from the URL builder, but you're, uh, you, only, you, you can have the exact same thing for all three if need be. So if your campaign that you're tracking is not that detailed, uh, you could use the same uh, campaign name across source, medium, and campaign. Uh, but if you can get detailed, uh, you or have the ability or are going to be utilizing multiple channels and you want to track that very carefully, um, we can put in different sources. So where do we plan to use the URL? Different mediums. What are the different assets or formats in which we're going to utilize the, the URL across the different sources? And then campaign is the name that it ties in together. We can also look at our behavior of our constituents and understand how they're utilizing our website. We'll see those very first stats that we talked about early on, including different page views, unique viewers. Uh, we also have average time on site, the bounce rate again, and the exit rate. And so just to reiterate, the bounce rate was the percentage of people who bounced after visiting one web page. That's different than the exit rate, which is the percentage of people for which the web page they're looking at was the last web page they looked at, whether they looked at one or ten before, doesn't matter. Uh, so those numbers will be different across our pages. We did also talk about, um, I think it was uh, Tara's point even, about the bounce rate being around 27%. Uh, we talked about not comparing to too much to industry averages, but I think it is interesting to know and helpful to know um, that the average time on web pages industry-wide for nonprofits is typically around two minutes. Uh, so if folks are spending more than two minutes on your page, you're doing great. Uh, but if you are really wanting to compare and improve, then, of course, we should be comparing against our own numbers. Uh, for bounce rate, we typically find industry average. Bounce rates are between 25 and 50 percent, and they range drastically. And that is because different pages uh, can have higher or low bounce rates for different reasons, and that's completely normal. Typically speaking, if we're trying to get a lower bounce rate, if we're trying to keep people engaged, then we want to aim for around 25% bounce rate. Um, a 50% bounce rate is still average. Anything above about a 50% bounce rate could be problematic depending on what the content is. Again, to Terry's point, sometimes that's actually exactly where we want it to be. So behavior is going to give us information like unique page views, that average time spent on the page, uh, also the entrances. 
so the number of times users entered our site through any specific page, and the total exits on each of those pages as well. Um, I do look at this information, especially the average time spent on a site to, uh, to, and average time spent on specific pages, I'll often look at to help figure out which web pages are keeping people's attention, uh, which web pages people maybe leave very quickly to determine where we might edit our, our content to add additional information, provide clear calls to action or next steps to try to keep them engaged, or even to link related articles, so giving the user something next to do. This is also true of our entrance pages. If we know that we have specific pages that uh, have the highest number of, of users entering our website, so this is often not our home page, these would be considered landing pages, then we probably want to make sure that those web pages speak well to about our organization and provide users, especially possibly first time users, with clear ideas of where to find their way around the site. So if we have a large number of users who are coming to our about page first, but we've put on our home page the introduction to who we are and how much we raised last year, then that home page message may not reach those who are landing on the about page first. So that's where we can focus on those landing pages and most used landing pages to best understand how people are entering our website. So I always love looking at this as a navigation and behavioral flows, which will really allow us to visually see how users are visiting our website. And we will notice from these that users are going everywhere. They're coming in through our home page. They're going to our secondary landing pages. There, some are then going off to other informational pages or content pages. And then we'll often have a large number of folks who are coming in uh, via other means outside of our home page, whether that's specific articles or specific landing pages. And it can be interesting to see where they're going. Are they, like we see here in this example, so this bottom group down here, we can see there's a large number of people who are uh, coming into this combined group of other pages. Uh, but we can see that a majority of those, or a large number of them, are actually going to the article section next. And we can see from red highlight here that a vast majority of those visiting the articles pages are actually leaving the website before visit reading another article. So this might give us a sense of where we have an opportunity to go fix or make improvements around our website uh, because we're losing a number of people there. That might be a pain point or an opportunity where we can fix and try to retain more users. So the question often is asked whether or not that exit rate is, is important or not. Because uh, they are going to leave at some time. Does it matter where they left from? Um, I think it's similar to our bounce rate in that it depends. Uh, sometimes a high exit rate makes sense. Uh, so the uh, confirmation page or the acknowledgement page of your donation form probably has a really high bounce rate. Users go to your website, they click on donate, they fill out the form, make a donation, they get a thank you page. Our thank you page says, thank you so much for donating, and usually not much else. It makes sense that we're going to have a high number of exits on that acknowledgement page. Um, it's up right. to us and to determine. Additionally, in, uh, additionally, in legal services, a lot of what we are trying to do is get people information in the least amount of clicks and put it on a single page so it's easy for them to access. So having that trajectory of traveling around your site a lot may actually and it may actually be a problem and not an advantage. So we're, the metrics are very different when we look at this particular group of nonprofits. That is such a great point. I, I really appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so I, I think it just goes back to it depends. We need to determine whether or not um, the metrics make sense, the exit rates make sense for the web pages that we're reviewing. And if we, for instance, want people to stick around and read an article, watch a video, or do something after donating, then we might need to improve that acknowledgement form or that acknowledgement page to try to keep their attention longer. Uh, if we are excited that they're, they're leaving because it means they're going off and doing something or calling us or, or doing work offline, then that exit rate may be a benefit and maybe a plus. Um, conversions. Conversions are uh, absolutely amazing and wonderful and, and unfortunately can be a little bit complicated. So conversions are basically the different ways in which we want our users to convert. 
and that can mean anything you want it to mean. So a conversion can be uh, a goal conversion can be a donation was made. So we want 10% of the people who visit our donation form to complete their donation. That would be set up as a goal conversion. And then it will track our uh, total completions of the goal and give us a conversion rate. We might even be able to assign a goal value to the conversion. This is really easy for things like donations where we know uh, on average, we can look at our historical data and we can figure out that on average for every uh, 10 online donations we have, um, that it averages out at $25 a donation. So we could then maybe value our goal completion at a certain amount to help us understand the value of the, the percentage of people who are converting. Um, but it's not necessary unless you're utilizing Google Ads or you're paying for your goals. Then you want to know whether or not the amount of money you're paying is actually resulting in returning in the proper conversions. If your conversions are donations, are downloads of a report or a document, a percentage scroll of a web page, so maybe understanding or trying to understand how people are reading content, viewing of a video, filling out a form like a contact form or a, a request form or a volunteer form or signing up for an event or making a, signing a petition, any of these hosted on your website can be a conversion. So any criteria? There's a great question. There's a great question here in the chat, which is how would you best track whether a linked file was downloaded? How do you get that information into your analytics? How would you track whether or not it was downloaded? Oh, the file was downloaded. That's yeah, a, that is a great one. So that's actually done via uh, what's called events. And so events in Google Analytics are not built in. They are a piece of secondary code that have to be added. For any, so any links to PDF documents, spreadsheets, Word documents, PowerPoint documents, uh, or even video or sound files from our website. Um, those, those links, those clicks are not tracked in Google Analytics automatically unless you put specific event code in your links. If you're using something like WordPress, they actually make a really great plugin uh, that you can use across your entire website and it will automatically insert that code into all links. If you're using uh, your own system and you're utilizing an HTML built system, uh, then it, just depending on how your system is built, you'll, you'll probably have to do that code individually for each link you want to track. So for each download you want to track, you'll have to uh, code that URL properly, which is a little annoying, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, Google Tag Manager, we should say, is actually going to make this much easier. Uh, Google Tag Manager, which we'll, we'll, we'll also talk about again, in a second, but Google Tag Manager is a new tool that Google is providing that allows you to quickly and easily set up uh, these types of conversions that we want to track, whether that's a certain button on a web page to be clicked or a form to be completed or any other action. Um, the Tag Manager is Google's new tool trying to simplify all of this. Uh, unfortunately, it is not simple yet, so it does require a learning curve. Uh, and it does require knowledge of HTML and ensuring that the proper HTML is used across your website header properties. So a bit of a technical answer, but hopefully that answers the question. Moving us right along here. So let's talk about conversions some more. So conversions actually can have, there are two main types of conversions. Uh, there are goals, which is just saying uh, the number of, of people who have done something, like download a document, reached a certain page, scrolled a certain percentage of a page. We can set any of those single actions as a goal. There are also multi-channel funnels. And multi-channel funnels is a multi-step goal. So we can think of a multi-channel funnel as being maybe our end of the year fundraising campaign. We're posting across multiple websites and trying to get people to come to our, uh, our, our page on our, our website where we're hosting a video, telling them about the important work we're doing we want them to watch the video and then click the button below it that says donate now. We want them to go to the donation form, complete the donation, and receive that uh, confirmation page. So there were multiple steps from visiting the website, landing on the web page, watching the viewer uh, video, clicking the donate button, making the donation. So that funnel can be set up. And the funnel can have multiple steps and multiple entrance points as well. And so they can help us figure out how people 
are utilizing the site in more complex methods or more complex tracking. So conversion uh, doesn't have to be complex. Um, there are actually some information online that can help you figure it out. Uh, but it can, and, and I would start with goals in that it's as simple as identifying a specific action that people are taking. So it can be as simple as saying the percentage of people who reach the, the confirmation page, the thank you page after making a donation. That's our goal. And if we start with those simple goals, uh, we'll start to see how they work, and we can then create more complex ones. So actually, I'm curious at this point, are there any stats or metrics we've talked about that uh, sound useful to folks that we maybe you're not really looking at right now or haven't looked at in depth and would want to go back and look at further? No, this has been a great overview so far. Okay. Yeah. And, and Chris, let me, let me just say that, um, and I think I've said this before on other webinars, so this may not be the first time that some folks have heard it, but I find that behavior flow report to be like it makes my head hurt <laughs> whenever oh. I look at it. Um, but your explanation did provide some insight into it. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. I, you, I, you know, so my issue with the behavior report is it's too much information. Right. It, it can quickly be overwhelming. So. Um, what I, my rule on any time I feel overwhelmed by information is trying to find the top three takeaways. And so I look at that, of, and thankfully they, they do visually put it um, in order. So the most visits or most visits to the next page, the most navigated visits uh, should appear at the top. I think what complicates it for a lot of folks is that there's always a big bucket at the bottom that's, group, that's all the other pages visited grouped together. Um, so I just suggest ignoring that because that's not really helpful knowing that 20% of the people from this web page visited some other web page on the website. Um, I want to know what are the top three most visited web pages after a certain web page was visited. So if we're looking at uh, using the example that was just provided at a, a web page on our website that has res legal resources and a legal document, then I would actually want to know that the navigation is to actually download that document or maybe to a contact form because we maybe we want people to contact us about that resource um, versus going to look at other resources or using the search page. If I see that the search page is up in the top or like the example, you know what, let me actually pull that up while I'm talking here. That example I just had uh, looking through and seeing that, um, so this here, so seeing that a large number of users who view the all other articles are going to the article's main landing page, I mean, that first and foremost tells me that users who are reading these articles are looking for more articles. From Idealware standpoint, that's a good thing. We want people to go look at other resources we have available and look at other articles. Uh, the drop-off from that is something that we could improve because that means that they're not finding what they wanted. Uh, and the example that y'all gave, though, of the legal resource being the, possibly the end of the user's experience, of we wanting it to keep it as short as possible, um, then them looking for more articles could imply that they're not finding the information they wanted in the first article. And so that may actually be a bad thing. And that's where it could be interesting to me. So we're going to talk about the body of data that's available to us and how we can utilize that in different ways uh, a bit further here. So the good news is most of the information that we need is available to us already. It's just a matter of figuring out where it is. Um, there's a lot of metrics and data that's already being tracked um, across other channels outside of web analytics, including our email metrics. Uh, so whether using MailChimp and getting really beautiful graphics or using constant compact or vertical response, constant contact, MailChimp, or using your own built-in uh, email, mass, uh, mass email system. They all have different types of metrics that are available to you, um, and they're generally the same metrics. You have your open rate, your click-through rate, and an unsubscribe rate. You may also have a conversion rate, uh, depending on whether or not you had links and whether or not your email system is associated with your content management system, your CMS. Uh, but the basics you're going to have, open, click-through, and unsubscribe rate. Your open rate is going to be a general estimate to the percentage of people who received your email uh, who actually opened it. Remember that open rates are based on whether or not a hidden image that's been inserted into your email was downloaded from the server via the recipient's computer. 
So that little technical aspect of having to download images in order for us to know whether or not somebody's opened an email does mean that our open rates are, are, are a minimum. They're not entirely accurate. And the reason being is that a lot of users uh, have images, image downloads and emails disabled as a security feature. Also, there's some issues with certain email clients and even some older mobile devices not properly telling the server it downloaded the image when it did. Um, so I always look at my open rate as a minimum. We know that at least 51.56% of the people who received this last email we sent opened it. And again, I like to compare against our own industry averages or our own, excuse me, uh, organizational averages um, because I'm much more interested in how we have compared to our past emails than I am how we compared to other organizations that look nothing like us. Uh, MailChimp does provide an industry average click-through rate, which can be interesting. Again, not entirely important. Uh, what is important is our click-through rate. So we can see here that 16.4% of those who opened the email clicked on a link within the email. And most email systems will combine any click in the email as a click-through rate. So if you have multiple resources linked or mo multiple calls to action, uh, they may not be tracked independently depending on the URLs used and the type of email program used. So generally speaking, open rate is gonna tell us how interesting our subject line was, how much people care about our brand, if they recognize our name, and how busy they are on the day and the time that they saw the email you sent. That's really all it tells us. It doesn't tell us whether or not somebody cares about the content we emailed because they haven't seen the content yet. They had not opened it. So it can only reference who sent the email, when it was sent, and the subject line and possibly the preview text, the very first few words in the email that may show up in the user's inbox preview pane. The click-through rate is going to be the content interest uh, metric. It's going to tell us whether or not users read the information we emailed them and whether or not they found specific information important. And that is one of the reasons I, I truly believe that emails to our constituents should try to drive them back to a web page so that we can get a measurement of interest. If we're including the entire resource in, in the email or the entire uh, in content in the email, like I see sometimes long new four or five 20 page newsletters sent via email, then we really have no idea who's read what and what content was most useful. We've also created, sent a very long, large document to our constituents via email, uh, which may not be the best way for them to be receiving and reading our content. Yeah, that's, Social media that's a really interesting one, because uh, in, in the legal community, we love email. We, we really, really like it. And the, the click-through rate to an actual web resource that covers the same thing is really small. So for example, if we just did a video over this webinar, um, I would put as much information as possible into that email, and the old link would be a link to the slides over on SlideShare where I can track it, and a link to the video. But they may never even touch the website. But the less information that I put into that email, the less likely they are to actually go watch the video or pick up the other resources. Uh, but how much information you want and where you want them to be matters a lot. Exactly. And that may be also depending on who you're contacting. So I find that um, the smaller your, your email list is, so the more targeted your list is, the better you know the, the recipients, the longer you can usually write in an email. Um, it's usually the long, uh, like I just got one the other day, I just got an email newsletter from an organization, and the email newsletter was six pages long, six email pages long of, of tech. And uh, it wasn't user, it wasn't friendly for my mobile device. Um, and also they mm -hmm. got no information on what of the, they were telling me about basically five or six different topics and resources, uh, all in one long email, for which they have no measure now of what I found interesting because there was nothing to click. So. Well, and, and I think you hit on a really important one there also on the mobile part. Your email must be mobile optimized. We get a higher percentage of individuals who are viewing email almost exclusively through phones. So yeah, simple yeah. make it very easy to see on a mobile device. Um, even anything you can do to optimize how quickly it downloads um, helps a lot. Completely agreed. Yeah, we're, we're easily seeing 
50% of web visitors nowadays, uh, generally speaking, are coming from, from mobile devices. And 70% uh, of email opens are generally coming from mobile devices. And around 85% of Facebook users are using mobile devices. So even when we're sharing content on Facebook, we need to be thinking if the web content that we're linking to, the article we're linking to on our website, is our website mobile friendly? Is it responsive? And especially with email, you are having so... Hit the, hit the nail right on the head. If if an email does not read well in my on my mobile device, I'm probably going to archive it or delete it. I'm not going to save it to read later, unless I have a really good relationship with your organization. So some other stats that we can look at. Oops, wrong way here. Other stats we can look at include social media metrics. Um, hopefully we've all seen these. Uh, but I do typically find that even those of us who know about them aren't actively using them. So I would just encourage us to look at these on a monthly basis. Facebook insights are the metrics associated with our Facebook accounts, our pages. These are for brand pages, not for personal accounts and not for groups. Uh, so these are only associated with pages that our organizations would probably have in men. So they're going to tell us a lot of the same data we get via the web metrics specific to our Facebook users. Who are they? How are they using our, our Facebook page? What posts are they clicking on? How many people are we reaching? Uh, Twitter analytics is uh, a bit newer, but mimics a lot of the information we'll find in Facebook Insights. Twitter analytics can be found via your gear icon in the upper right-hand drop-down of Twitter, and then just choosing analytics. Or you can go to analytics.twitter.com and immediately go into the Twitter account, uh, the analytics account. Same thing, Twitter analytics is going to give us a bunch of different data related to who our users are, including demographic information, where they are, gender identity, age groups, interest levels, as well as how they're engaging with us. So which of our posts are being retweeted, uh, replied to, how many times our accounts are mentioned. Both Facebook Insights and Twitter Analytics have an engagement rate. And uh, I do like to just share that they are slightly different in that Facebook Insights utilizes reach and Twitter utilizes impressions to calculate our engagement rate. What this basically means is, so in a reach are the total number of unique people our content has reached. Facebook knows reach, and Facebook knows reach very, very well, because Facebook knows how many times it delivers our content to how many people, and it calculates that for us. Impressions are the total number, number of time our content was displayed for those users it reached. So we may have reached a 1,000 unique users, but the content was displayed, our posts were displayed 1,500 times. So we have more impressions than we do reach. Twitter, unfortunately, utilizes impressions, which is the number of times your tweet was displayed, and not necessarily the unique count of users that we find with Facebook's reach. That does mean that the engagement numbers are slightly different, because impressions on, on, on Twitter are going to be much, much greater uh, than the amount of number of people we've reached on Facebook. But we will typically find that the engagement rate across both sites will hover sometime, somewhere between 2 and 5%. Uh, it may be less, it may be more, depending on your organization. Um, but I, I usually look at a 2 to 5% range as an average range, uh, depending on the organization I'm working with. And, and we, of course, are trying to increase our engagement rate. Our engagement rates are just that. It's the rate of people who saw our content, who actually engaged with it, who liked it, clicked on it, reshared it, commented on it, watched the video. Those are all engagements, and they're combined to get our engagement rate. Also remember that Facebook and Twitter both give us analytics on our users and where they're at as well, uh, which can be helpful when, if we're ever planning local events. So I did this with an author we were working with, and we were planning some local meetups, and we were trying to figure out what towns what cities to target. And so we went through their web and social analytics and looked at the demographic information of where people were visiting our accounts from and who our users were. And we were able to tell where we already had a large number of folks in what top 10 cities. And then we could plan to target our events in those cities where we already had a following, where we already know there's an audience. If you're using Facebook's targeted post option, you can even reach just those people. So if we're doing an event in New York City, we can use Facebook's targeting option when writing any post to our page. It's right there next to the send button or the schedule button. 
And you can tell Facebook to only show that post to people who are in New York City. So we can then use the metrics to understand where people are at to then target information and content towards those people. YouTube insights are also incredibly interesting in that uh, if you're not utilizing YouTube yet, uh, definitely consider it, it as a communications channel. And I would also reconsider it if it's something that your organization used to use and hasn't come back to in a while. Uh, whereas the last several years on social media has been kind of the year of images or years of images and media, the current uh, this year and the coming years are the year of video, whether it's live video or recorded video we're going to see video usage continue to increase. And YouTube is still the number one video-hosted website in the world. Uh, YouTube also has implemented no a bunch of nonprofit options lately, including the ability to get 100% donations via YouTube videos. So our YouTube insights are going to tell us lots of data beyond just our, our viewer count. And so I find that often organizations are looking at our subscriber, our channel subscriber number, and we're looking at the number of views a specific video got. And those are both great numbers, but they don't tell the whole story. And so if you actually click on the number of views any video got, you can get into the deeper data for that video, uh, for videos that you have access to that you own on your channel. You can get deeper data, including the different types of engagements that videos got, but you can also walk, uh, walk through your video and you can see exactly how users watched your video. You can see at what second on your video users stopped watching when they dropped off. And so that can help you, us figure out how do we create better video content by ensuring that we don't have those drop-off points or figuring out what we did during that drop-off point that possibly lost users' interest. We can again, of course, find demographic information about who's using our videos, so who's watching our videos, where they're from, gender, and age groups as well. And finally, our blog metrics, if we're hold, holding or utilizing secondary blog functionality via Medium, Tumblr, WordPress, or any other uh, third-party system outside of our main website, then we would just want to make sure we've also put uh, analytics tracking on our blog whether that's built-in, so the built-in metrics already provided by the software we're using, or if it's setting up Google Analytics to ensure that we're getting a full picture of how people are viewing our content. And then we can also track offline metrics. It can be a little bit harder, but we can track the number of mailings we've sent out, the number of people who received the mail. We can track the number of responses we've received to those offline. We can even use vanity URLs or short URLs to create custom URLs in our print materials so we can track how many people take online actions based on our offline actions. And finally, it's not enough just to track all this or have access to this. We actually have to analyze all of this data. We have to look and figure out what does it mean. There are various ways of doing that, and I think the most common way that most of us are doing it is what we call measurement as therapy. And this is the idea that we post an article to our Facebook page this morning, and we go back and look at it a couple hours later, or maybe after the session is over, or tomorrow morning, and we see how many likes it got, or how many comments it got, and we feel good about that, or we don't. It's measurement as therapy. How many likes our Instagram photos get, or how many uh, favorites or retweets our tweet gets on a case-by-case -case basis uh, is, is probably not the most helpful in helping us manage our communications better and take better actions towards reaching our goals. It's just going to either make us feel bad or feel good. Uh, sometimes it can help us spot trends, so we can see if an order or if a post is overperforming, and if they... In fact, Facebook is very good at telling us all now this whenever a post overperforms because they want us to boost it. Uh, so th in those instances, that might be helpful to look at, uh, but otherwise we're not going to want to look at a post day to day. It's often going to take several hours, possibly several days for the metrics to truly accumulate and matter. Another common method of data exploration is, uh, or excuse me, of uh, measurement is exploration. And this is when something has happened and we're trying to figure out what happened. So we have a large number of views or we suddenly have 20 donations come through and we normally get one a day. Or we see a spike in the number of completions or registrations for an event or maybe even reads or visits to an article or download of a resource. 
we're probably going to want to start to explore what happened in those situations. We're going to want to look at the sources for those to figure out how people got there. And we're going to want to look at what they did next to figure out uh, how well the content served them. Again, it's interesting and helpful information, but it's not how we're going to ma manage our website in the long term to make informed decisions and improve our content. In order to do that, we're going to use measurement as action. So measurement as action is actually thinking about the people who are utilizing our website and how they're utilizing it and making decisions based on the metrics provided that we can then measure and test. So it's looking at our metrics and figuring out, if we're looking at our social media metrics, that we want to increase the number of folks who are clicking through from, Facebook, from Twitter, or we want to increase the conversion rate of users from Facebook, or we want to increase the read-through rate, the scroll of a specific article. Then we're going to actually utilize metrics to help determine where we're at. We're going to make changes, and we're going to test whether or not it worked. We do have to remember, so measurement in general, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it can also be really, really overwhelming. There is so much information available to us. I think it's Facebook's Insights. Uh, they have a download the Excel option where you can download a spreadsheet of all your Facebook metrics. And uh, they used to, I'm not sure if they still call it this, but they used to call that download the list of priority metrics. And they prioritized over 250 different metrics in that list. It was overwhelming. It's way too much and it's more than most of us can ever handle. So we do need to decide what to measure, and we're going to decide that around what our goals are. We can often start that out by asking questions. What are we trying to learn? What are we trying to improve? And what are we trying to accomplish? So those questions are going to help us understand the metrics that we need to be tracking, in whether short-term or long-term, and they're going to help us focus and find a little bit of balance between collecting really reasonable amounts but amounts that are going to give us quality information and allow us to make decisions. I always go back to a, uh, it's an old organization I used to work with that we were doing a database transfer with them and or uh, merger with them, and they had voting history data for constituents that they had somehow got through some other partnership, and they had imported into their fundraising, their donor database. And we were transferring, and they had you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of data fields and information related to all of this other data that they've been collecting. And they wanted it transferred over, of course, and it was a bit of a mess. And I said, you know, you've been collecting this. I could see that they've been collecting it for years. And I said, I asked them, I said, you know, tell me, how have you ever used this data? And unfortunately, they couldn't because they had never used the data. So that is only as useful as, we, as, we, as, it, as it is when we use it, as we make it. So if we're not using the data, it's probably not important for us to focus on. And we, put for, again, figure out what we're focusing on by asking questions. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. So, Chris, we are at the hour and a half point here, so I think this may be a good point to kind of wrap it up. Uh, we are starting okay. to lose people, but I, I think we've got some really good information that has come out there. Is there a last point or two that you would like to close on? I think we can actually close on this, which is just going back and, and when figuring out what to do with our metrics, it's asking what are we trying to accomplish? What do we want to change? What do we want to learn? What do we want to achieve? Explore the metrics to figure out what data we already have available to us. Figure out whether or not it gives us the answer. May, uh, hypothesize. Make it a, a informed uh, assumption of what's happening and test those results. If you're trying to increase the number of video views, page views, um, action completions, make a decision and test it, follow up with the metrics again, and see whether or not it improved or not. And that's how we'll, we will be able to utilize metrics best. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. I also want to say um, thank you to Terry Ross out there for giving us some uh, practical examples related to legal aid. Thank you so much for coming out. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you all. Have a great day.